medical liver biopsy, as we've discussed uh, for the past two lectures, poses a lot of uh, difficulties for many people. And I'm, again, going to take a mechanistic model building approach to help you understand how to deal with livers with uh, steatosis or potentially, quote, fatty liver disease. There are many questions that I have when dealing with these types of cases, including how to define steatosis and how to define steatohepatitis. What are the ideologies of fatty liver disease? And what's with the terms of micro versus macro vesicular steatosis in terms of nomenclature? Can we distinguish ethanol induced fatty liver disease from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? And how do we stage the fibrosis in these types of liver injury processes? What are the mechanisms involved? And the most important question with anything of the above is, why should we even care? So during the session, I will try to address each of these questions uh, with model building and with individual cases. So my approach to this lecture and to most everything is to build models. And the way that we're going to build models to help us understand fatty liver disease is to take a very mechanistic approach in how the liver handles lipids and its lipid metabolism and understand how aberrations in that metabolic system may lead to fatty liver diseases. So here's the general model for what we will discuss today. The triangle represents the liver. And the liver is, plays a very central role in terms of lipid metabolism. So many things go into the liver, including lipids. The liver then resynthesizes, metabolizes, uses for its own energy source, but then repackages lipids and then exports them out uh, to the rest of the body. So this is an incredibly dynamic state of how the liver does metabolize lipids and aberrations all along this pathway may lead to aberrations of lipid metabolism, which can lead to steatosis and steatohepatitis. So let's start out with a case that uh, had recently, and this is a 30-some-year-old woman who noticed that she had scleral ectoris and she presented to the urgent care. At that time, an MRI showed an enlarged liver and thrombosis of the uh, partial thrombosis of the right hepatic vein and intrahepatic portal vein. And at that time, she was given a diagnosis of Bud Chiari. I think from our prior lectures, you should immediately ask a question clinically in terms of this imaging study as to whether or not there was ascites. And the reason for that is patients pre presenting with Bud Chiari, acute Bud Chiari, should have some amount of ascites. Her laboratory exam showed that she did, in fact, have a total increase in bilirubin. Her alkaline phosphatase, a measure of biliary type injury, was elevated. Her liver transaminases, ALT and AST, uh, particularly the AST was elevated with really non-elevation of her ALT. And her uh, coagulation factors are shown here, slightly prolonged, and her albumin was in fact a bit decreased. So evidence perhaps of either decreased liver synthetic function and or increased uh, consumption of, by the body to explain the low albumin. Her physical exam showed that she did have lower extremity edema and a liver biopsy was performed. So you might be asking right away, why are we starting out with a case that is seemingly vascular liver injury when the title of this lecture is supposed to be steatosis? Well, again, I want to approach this lecture from a case-based standpoint, and I will show you what the liver biopsy shows in this particular case in light of the clinical presentation, which screams to be a vascular ideology liver injury. 
So from our prior conversations, I show you at the top diagram, my cartoon of a liver with a portal tract on your far left composed of a um, portal vein, the green being the bile duct, the red being the hepatic artery, noting that the bile duct and the hepatic artery are of the same caliber and the portal vein occupying about 75% of the total volume or surface area of the portal tract. One then goes into the sinusoids lined by the hepatic cords, which are lined by fenestrated endothelium. And in the hepatic cords, the coupling of the hepatocytes are shown by the volcanoliculus in green. The blood then flows in the sinusoids and exits through the terminal venules, um, as shown to your far right. I show you now that lightning bolt, because if we were to have a venous outflow obstruction level of injury, it would affect first the terminal venules. Over time, then one would get the diagram down below to show that in response to that venous outflow obstruction, that pressure initiates a fibrogenetic response as shown now by laying down of uh, type one collagen as shown in blue, along zone three, which represents pressure gradient with subsequent um, atrophy of the hepatocytes. That pressure then flows back to the portal vein, causing its diminution in size, and actually causes bile proliferation through a pressure initiating event and may in point of fact present in a cholestatic manner in which this patient presumably does. So this would be the liver biopsy expectation in light of venous outflow obstruction. Now let's go to this patient's um, liver biopsy if in point of fact, she does have um, venous outflow obstruction and this is what we would expect her liver biopsy uh, to look like. So I show you the cartoon on the upper aspect of this picture. I show you then the H&E of what we would expect, and then I show you the trichrome. Importantly, you can see that there's no inflammation. You may or may not see sinusoidal dilatation. And the hepatocytes look like hepatocytes. Uh, there's no steatosis or any clearing in them. But a trichrome stain re uh, reveals the fibrosis along zone three, uh, demonstrating the response to the pressure from venous outflow obstruction. Turning to our case now, this is the liver biopsy from the patient initially presented. And I think what we can see at low power is it looks nothing like one expected from pure venous outflow obstruction. And in particular, the yellow lines now, the circled areas show you the portal tract areas. And what one can see if one focuses on those that yes, in point of fact, there's bile ductual proliferation. The paddock vein, yes, uh, the portal vein, in fact, yes, has diminution in its caliber change in, in size. The paddock artery is present and there's not much in the way of inflammation. And so one may say, well, that may be perfectly compatible with what I just showed you. However, as you turn towards the hepatocytes, you can now see that they have a very different tentorial quality than that expected in pure venous outflow obstruction. And what we can see is that the hepatocytes are not decreased in size, but in actuality are increased in size with a rarefication of their cytoplasm. And on closer power, what we can see is that these hepatocytes are increased in size compared to normal hepatocytes. And I've circled now with a dashed line, these hepatocytes that now demonstrates a very important finding that we call ballooning degeneration. Ballooning degeneration is a rarefication of the cytoplasm of hepatocytes due to lipid accumulation and the toxic, toxic metabolites therein, pushing the nucleus to the, side, to the side. And you can just see the increased size of the hepatocytes and again, the rarefication of its cytoplasm. That is ballooning degeneration. And in my opinion, this is the hallmark to make a diagnosis of steatohepatitis. However, 
just be incredibly careful that ballooning degeneration alone may not necessarily always be equivalent with a steatotic pattern of injury. And I'll show you how that works in, in a moment. In addition to the ballooning degeneration in areas of a little bit of steatosis in this patient going along with steatohepatitis, we also see that there's an area of acute inflammation. In terms of our last lecture, we went through a number of hepatitic patterns of injury, both acute and chronic. And in all of those cases, the inflammatory infiltrate present was one of a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, i.e. mononuclear. Acute inflammation does not equate to acute hepatitis, and I think that's an important concept. But acute inflammation in this particular setting, given that it's out in the hepatocellular lobules, is another evidence piece of evidence to go along with a ballooning degeneration and steatohepatitic pattern of injury. What it turns out is that these neutrophils are being attracted to the following. Here is another uh, place within this liver biopsy this of our patient. There are evidence of, again, of ballooning degeneration. And, but in addition, the hour shows you here what is called the Mallory body or Mallory Dank body. The name is based upon two individuals, but mechanistically what this represents is a condensation of intermediate filaments and more specifically a ubiquination of intermediate filaments and their subsequent condensation that leads to the accumulation and given this Mallory body. So Mallory body represents a problem in the cytoskeleton of the hepatocyte, and it may be a result of more proximal steatohepatitic pattern of injury. But again, be very careful because other liver injuries may give you abundant Mallory hyaline, particularly any chronic cholestatic disorder may give you abundant Mallory hyaline. It turns out that mechanistically, chronic cholestatic disorders and steatohepatitic disorders have a lot in common and at the crux of the crossroads has to do with cholesterol metabolism. But the point being that Mallory body represents a ubiquitated intermediate filament and a disassociation of the cytoskeleton of the hepatocyte may be seen in steatohepatitis, but may be seen in chronic cholestatic disorders. And more importantly, in terms of explaining the neutrophilic infiltration in this patient's liver, Mallory body may be a chemoattractive agent for neutrophils. The neutrophils, again, do not equate to an acute event. One can have long-standing, i.e. chronic steatohepatitic patterns of injury with neutrophils and hence do not make the mistake of saying it's a neutrophilic infiltrate, hence cannot be a chronic process. In terms of our case, let's now look at the pattern of fibrosis here. What we see is that the fibrosis in this particular patient is really has a very fine reticulated network or pericellular or quote chicken wire pattern of fibrosis throughout the liver. It is not in keeping with expected of that expected with venous outflow obstruction. So all of the features that we have in this particular liver biopsy show no evidence of bud PRE, i.e. show no evidence of venous outflow obstruction. And the way that we put this particular patient together so far is that it appears that there is a steatohepatitic pattern of injury with extensive pericellular and portal fibrosis. One may ask, given this pattern of fibrosis, how should we stage the fibrosis? There are various um, metrics by which one may stage the fibrosis. There are various uh, Metavir and other types of scoring systems for staging fibrosis. What I have said in the prior lectures is I take the stance of not using numbers, but I use words. And here's my reasoning 
for, for the way that I put my reports out. First of all, if you are using a published scoring system, one has to be very cognizant of the disease ideology for which the scoring system was, um, is being used. So for example, the Medivir scoring system uh, and its predecessor, the original Nodell scoring systems were made for viral hepatitides. It would be, not be applicable to being a salicylate obstruction or steatohepatitic patterns of injury. Uh, for those in the know, you may say, well, yes, now there is actually scoring systems and, and grading schemes out there for non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases. And yes, in point of fact, that's true. And one can read about those uh, scoring and staging systems. And those are very nicely illustrated in papers. And their use is, is uh, thought to be mostly for work in clinical trials. I'm not saying that one should not, cannot use them in their daily clinical work, but just be very cognizant of choosing the correct scoring system if one is going to use them. And just again, just be very um, cognizant of the intent of their um, original making. Now, so how do we even stage this? I would say that there is moderate fibrosis, uh, including extensive pericellular in a chicken wire pattern. Okay. And we can now look at higher power, and I show you here the incredible space of dis or pericellular fibrosis that is typical for steatohepatitic patterns of injury. Is this equivalent to in and of itself steatohepatitic patterns of injury? Well, the answer is no. One has to put all the features together. One can see extensive space of dis fibrosis and other situations, including cholestatic situations, but also including um, really uh, severe uh, viral hepatitides. So for example, we know that with hepatitis B and even hepatitis C in the immune compromised state, that those may give rise to the so-called cholestatic hepatitic variant of those types of viral hepatitides. And they too may have extensive space of dysfibrosis. So no one feature that I've shown, shown you here is going to be um, indicative of one ideology. Again, it's putting all the pieces together. So it turns out with this patient, we knew that yes, this was not in keeping with venous outflow obstruction, that it was a steatohepatitic pattern of injury with extensive fibrosis. And on further investigation, with the patient, it turned out that the patient was in fact, and had in fact used for some time alcohol. And so what is interesting in this patient is the clinical presentation, the, the particular laboratory enzyme profile that I showed you, particularly with the cholestatic presentation, but as we will come to the AST elevation with minimal of any ALT elevation, and in this particular case, there was steatosis, but not a lot. And one may ask, well, why wasn't there a lot of steatosis? Well, that is because the patient had been using alcohol, but for the past few weeks had stopped using it, probably because they became very ill. So the steatosis in fatty liver disease, particularly alcohol, if you stop the alcohol, the steatosis can go away rather quickly, i.e. within a few weeks. But some of the steatohepatitic features, including ballooning degeneration and Mallory body, will hang along for on the order of months. So let's now turn to case two before we get to in terms of some of the mechanisms. And this um, relatively young woman with an elevated BMI was found to have mildly elevated transaminases. She underwent a liver biopsy, and this is her liver biopsy. What we can see here is, yes, now we can see in point of fact that there is extensive steatosis as shown by the vacuoles within the hepatocytes. As one looks across the liver biopsy to the right, one can now see that the tentorial textural quality of the hepatocytes 
starts to change. And you can see that now there is a little bit more granularity to that cytoplasm. This shows you that those hepatocytes are undergoing ballooning degeneration, as shown here on higher power. So we have pretty severe steatosis because most of the hepatocytes have fat, as shown by the vacuole in the hepatocytes. And we have a significant amount of ballooning degeneration. So we have severe steatosis with moderate to severe steatohepatitis, as shown by the ballooning degeneration. And the arrows now show you these hepatocytes with ballooning to type degeneration. At low power, we can see here the trichrome stain shows that at low power, yes, there is portal fibrosis, and yes, in some cases, it may, there may be focal bridging from portal, pack to short portal tract. And as we go higher power, we can also see, as with our first case, that there is some in the way of this pericellular fibrosis, space of disc fibrosis, that is, again, very typical for steatohepatitic patterns of injury. In contrast, the type of fibrosis with the usual hepatitic or viral or autoimmune hepatitic patterns of injury is very clean and smooth bands of fibrosis. This space of disc fibrosis, again, is typical for the out of hepatitic patterns of injury. And on higher power, you can see how, it, how that fibrosis is pericellular and particularly around the out of hepatitic or wounding degeneration of those hepatocytes. Here is a reticulin stain to make the point uh, once again that in fatty liver diseases, the reticulin framework around those steatotic hepatocytes may not be complete, and one does not want to misinterpret this as hepatocellular carcinoma. I do not misinterpret this as macrotrabecular architecture. So be careful about interpreting reticulin stains and the steatotic liver. Okay. So in this particular case, unlike our first case, her steatohepatitis, because there was no alcohol use and she had the appropriate um, constitution and metabolic uh, features, is consistent with steatohepatitis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Why do we care about that? Well, we care about that for a number of reasons. First of all, it is becoming one of the most um, prevalent chronic liver diseases worldwide. Um, there are certainly geographic differences in terms of its uh, prevalence. And importantly, that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and not obesity correlates with an overall increased cancer risk in these patients. Yes, liver cancer, but other cancers as well. So obesity per se is not, is not associated, but if one has a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that is a marker for increased cancer risk of many cancer types in these patients. Now, while it is true that patients with obesity have an increased risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we do know that there are patients who are not obese that may have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the so-called lean NAPL. And I will show you the mechanisms involved in that. So the overall classification of this goes under the category of metabolic syndrome. And I'll show you mechanistically how we think that some of the lipid metabolism does is altered in these patients leading to this situation. As this disease is increasing uh, in, in terms of its incidence and hence prevalence, it is becoming a global problem. And these patients may have initially normal liver associated enzymes. So one of the big difficulties is how do we start to screen for these patients to try to have intervention? And I'm not going to be able to answer that during this session today. So in terms of the diagnostic reports, as I said before, I like to put pattern of injury, severity when appropriate, ideology, and the degree of fibrosis, i.e. the stage. So it could be, in this last case, severe steatosis with moderate steatohepatitis, with moderate portal fibrosis, including areas of bridging, 
in mild to moderate space of dysfibrosis. Okay. Now, given all of the scoring and staging and other schemes out there for fatty liver disease and, and as such, one may ask, what are the key features that are important in terms of having prognostic implications in terms of these patients? Is it the degree of steatohepatitis? Is it the degree of inflammation? Well, a very nice article that uh, I referenced for you here has shown that the most important feature so far we have in terms of patient prognosis and liver biopsy is the amount of fibrosis. And I'll show you an adapted graph Patients that had minimal fibrosis, just mild fibrosis, their um, lifetime survival compared to controls is the same. If one starts to have more fibrosis, say some, some bridging fibrosis, decreased survival. And yeah, when you have more advanced fibrosis, your survival is not as good as less fibrosis. So it turns out that the stage of the disease is really one of the most important features that we have at this point of time. Turning our attention to fatty liver disease and more specifically to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, these patients may progress to cirrhosis without even realizing that they have fatty liver disease. And by the time they get to cirrhosis, if you were to do a biopsy or look at the liver explants, they may have no steatosis. And that's very typical for patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that the more advanced in terms of fibrotic stage their disease is, their amount of steatosis goes down. That being said, sometimes you may find telltale signs. Here I show you a ballooning or a steatohepatitic hepatocyte, but no, really the lack of obvious steatosis. And you can say, well, Look at all the chronic inflammation in the portal tract. How do you know that this isn't viral hepatitis C giving this liver disease? Well, there's two things. One, we always check the laboratory examination and get all of that clinical data together. And the second is to realize that in all fatty liver diseases, be it alcohol or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the portal tracts may have a rather exuberant amount of chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Do not make the mistake of assuming that this is a chronic hepatitis and going on to say, well, it might be autoimmune or viral hepatitis. That's, that is not correct. Be very aware that chronic inflammation in the portal tract, including some degree of interface hepatitis, is very typical for all fatty liver disease, and, and you may not want to, again, invoke autoimmune hepatitis. Okay. Well, once one gets to the end stage of liver disease, due to fatty liver disease, one, these patients may undergo liver transplantation, and that's wonderful. Well, what is the survivor of that? Well, with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the overall survival of the patient and their graft is actually very good and very comparable to other ideologies. It does recur in the allograft, but it does not progress that much to fibrosis. So that's some good news. But be aware that, of course, cirrhosis due to fatty liver disease or cirrhosis due to any ideology increases the risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. And as with other ideologies, hepatocellular carcinoma as an individual feature clearly negatively impacts patient outcome status post liver transplantation. Okay. Now getting into some of the mechanisms of how one gets liver injury with fatty liver disease. In order to understand that, we have to understand what lipids are and understand the life of a lipid. What are lipids? Well, lipids are hydrophobic molecules and they may be broken into various classes. I show you here a cholesterol type molecule with a steroid back ring. Um, I show you here a fatty acid, uh, and now I show you a glycerol backbone. And to make the following points, fatty acids have on one end are very hydrophobic, on the other end are um, hydrophilic. 
and this, the uh, triglyceride is very hydrophilic. In order for fatty acids to be carried, and we'll show you how, they are bound to the triglyceride background to give you a triglyceride. And that's a triglyceride. If one puts on various molecules on the cholesterol backbone here or the fatty acid, hydrophilic molecules, we have cholesterol and fatty acid esters respectively. Okay, now, how does our body deal with lipids? What I'm showing you now in the gray, in the gray rectangle here is our um, enterocyte in the small bowel. So when one has and eats lipids, what happens? Well, the cholesterol type molecules can simply diffuse through the membrane into your enterocyte. However, in the case of triglycerides, through the work of lipase from the pancreas, the fatty acids are broken off the backbone, and those fatty acids then are transported, diffused through the cytoplasm membrane into the cytoplasm of your small bowel epithelial cells. At that point, they make a, a triglyceride back, backbone, and then the enterocyte then, its job is to package up those lipids to export into the bloodstream. How do they do that? Well, they package them into chylomicrons. And the way that they do that is by making various lipoproteins on the outer and on the inner is the core of triglycerides and the cholesterol. At that point, that chylomicron now is able to be transported out of the small bowel ep epithelium into the bloodstream. It is then circulated and through the action of lipoprotein lipase, free fatty acids are cleaved off of the triglyceride backbone, which are then given to various organs such as heart, muscle, and importantly, the adipocytes for storage. The heart and the muscle uses them for energy and the adipocytes store them in the form of lipid. It then decreases the amount of triglycerides it has, and now is a chylomicron remnant. And that chylomicron remnant goes to the liver and through an LDL receptor is taken up into the liver. So now we have the chylomicron remnant in the liver and the hepatocyte, the workhorse, and through various metabolic mechanisms, fatty acids and cholesterols are repackaged, metabolized, and resynthesized into another into another lipoprotein molecule called DLDL, very low density lipoprotein. It is exported out of the liver, and then it too goes to the bloodstream, meets other organs, and the amount of triglycerides subsequently, subsequently decreases to give uh, IDL and then the end particle LDL, which now has its cholesterol is very rich in cholesterol with the triglycerides being delivered to other organs. The LDL then may deliver cholesterol to macrophages through the LDL receptor, but then is recirculated back to the liver and taken up to the liver through the LDL receptor. Okay. Now let's turn to our hepatocyte that has a lipid C in it, i.e. a steatotic hepatocyte. The hepatocyte may have lipid in it when it stores various fatty acids or cholesterol and it has to store them. And the way that it stores them is similar to a chylomicron in the sense that the lipid is not just free floating, it is bound by a protein matrix on the outer. And I show you that by the blue figures. In order to gain access to free up some of those fatty acids from that lipid triglyceride core, there's lipases in the hepatocyte. The protein uh, outer core, so to speak, has to give way such that it gains, the lipase may gain access to that liver, to that lipid. It then cleaves the fatty acids off of the triglyceride backbone, freeing up fatty acids into the cytoplasm. Now, importantly, free fatty acids are actually very toxic to cells, okay? It's almost like a soap, it is a soap. So 
what happens is that free fatty acid then is repackaged into our chylomicron VLDL, which is then exported out of the hepatocyte and circulated to the rest of the organs. That's how the liver can store lipid and then get rid of it. If one cannot do that, one can build up the amount of lipid within the hepatocyte. So one of the key contexts is in terms of considering the dynamic flow of lipids in and out of the liver is to understand that the export of lipid from the hepatocyte requires the production of lipoproteins. Hence, it requires protein production and assembly. And so if one had a defect in that assembly of lipoprotein particles, and had continued delivery of fatty acids and lipids to the hepatocyte, one would have the buildup of lipid, i.e. a steatotic liver. Now, can that happen? Well, the answer is yes, and I'm showing you an example here. Here is an example of a liver where you can see that there is steatosis, and the steatosis is right near the portal tracts, i.e. it's zone one steatosis. This is a case that came about because this person has protein calorie malnutrition. And in that situation, they're still getting a lot of calories, but they don't have enough protein in order to synthesize the lipoproteins. And therefore, the lipid accumulates in the hepatocyte. It gets there, but it can't be exported out by the LDL. That's called quashicor. Now, in looking at vacuoles within liver don't assume that all spaces in the liver equal steatosis. I show you here of another, you could say it is a lipid disorder because vitamin A is a lipid compound, but vitamin A, when it's, uh, one has too much of it in your body, is stored in the stellate cells and gives rise to, quote, stellate cell hyperplasia. It's not really hyperplasia, it's that these stellate cells are storing the vitamin A, and they are not hepatocytes, but one may at first glance confuse them for a steato, uh, steatosis, and they're not. Now, why do we care about having too much vitamin A in our stellate cells? Well, it can in, um, start a fibrogenetic response and can cause fibrosis in the liver, but through a different mechanism than steo, steatohepatitis, so, all right. To finish our lipid life story here, another closure to the lipid is that HDL, which is rich in cholesterol, goes to the liver. And that is one of the ways that one can rid the body of cholesterol by taking that cholesterol and synthesizing them into bile acids, which are then subsequently excreted through the body. So how does it work that one has a steatohepatitic or steatosis in the setting of the metabolic syndrome. Here is a model that I've put together to help to explain some of the findings. First of all, on the, the yellow circles I show you are the adipocytes. The adipocytes themselves also have a dynamic equilibrium state with lipases that help to cleave fatty acids for delivery to the body. So, in the setting of insulin resistance, there is a shift in, in that equilibrium to the point where they release a lot of the free fatty acids because insulin is important in the regulation of that lipase activity. So with that resistance, free fatty acids are released from adipocytes. They are then delivered to the liver. The liver then takes that excess free fatty acids and stores them in the in and a lipid droplet, they do try to export them out in terms of VLDL as well. However, if they continue to store that free fatty acid, one has increased number of lipid droplets, hence steatosis. Now, having steatosis is not the same as having steatohepatitis. So what is the trigger that goes from steatosis to steatohepatitis? That is not entirely known, but one of them may be, that, again, that excess free fatty acids themselves may be cytotoxic. 
Another important feature of metabolic syndrome that may explain some of the lean, non-alcoholic, lean, non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases is the fact that there are inherited forms of these fatty liver disorders. In particular, I've shown you two proteins, one associated with the adipocytes and the other associated with that protein uh, that bounds the lipid droplets and the hepatocytes. So when these proteins are mutated, first of all, in the adipocytes, it may cause an increased release of free fatty acids independent of insulin resistance. And in the case of mutation in those proteins that coat the lipid droplet and hepatocytes, it may pre prevent the action of lipase in the gaining access to the lipid droplet and the hepatocyte. And hence, you may have a buildup of lipid droplets in the hepatocyte. You may therefore also have a decrease in the export of the LDL you have increased free fatty acids in the hepatocytes as well. That may explain some of the steatosis and steatohepatitis associated with the mutations in these two particular proteins. Another important feature we have to keep in mind and understand is that mitochondria and peroxisomes are important in terms of lipid metabolism. And particularly in the case of mitochondria, how they help in terms of understanding the injury that may occur in steatosis and steatohepatitis is to understand that the role of the mitochondria in terms of lipid is to take that fatty acid and to start to cleave it through the action of three enzymes or three steps leading to what we call beta oxidation that results in a two carbon cleavage to cleave acetyl CoA. And that then fatty acid can continue on to continue to be cleaved um, and metabolized appropriately. This will then lead to feeding it into the TCA cycle for um, energy production. But the acetyl CoA may also leave the mitochondria, giving rise to ketone bodies. When there is uncoupling of this beta oxidation, it can lead to free radical production, and that will lead to cellular damage. So there is a decoupling of those processes in the setting sometimes of fatty liver disease, which may explain some of the cellular injury. Now, the acetyl-CoA, or the acid aldehyde, is an important molecule. First of all, it is important because it can cause help to cause acetylation which happens normally in the regulation of normal events within the cell. But if un uncontrolled, it can acetylate many molecules that it's not supposed to. And if it acetylates molecules in the mitochondria, it can lead to mitochondrial damage. And I want to show you a model I put together to explain ballooning degeneration. I show you here had a patocyte as a blue square. And the orangish brownish lines represent the cytoskeletal framework or the microtubule system within the hepatocyte. This is important in terms of maintaining its shape as well as helping a protein trafficking. With particularly with alcohol use, one can have an incredible amount of uh, acetyl CoA production that can start to acetylate the microtubules and cytoskeletal within the hepatocyte. That can lead to its degradation of its network. And you can imagine, therefore, having a breakage of that cytoskeletal network leading to cellular damage that results in what we call balloony degeneration. So the balloony degeneration does, in point, represent the fact that the cytoskeletal network has undergone degradation. As well, particularly in the setting of alcohol use, one may see PAS positive, diastase resistant globules within the hepatocyte, particularly around the peripheral area. While this may make one think that the person has additionally alpha-1 amitriptyline deficiency, more often than that, the person 
is does not have that underlying problem. What this represents is, it was described decades ago, is the so-called protein secretion block that may occur in the setting of alcoholic liver disease, but now has been seen in other chronic liver diseases as well. The way that I think about this is that perhaps this accumulation of non-mutated alpha-1 amnitrypsin as occurs through the same process that leading to Dublini degeneration, i.e. acetylation of the microtubular network that is very important in terms of protein and endoplasmic reticulum protein trafficking. So that's how I have put together um, that finding. Now let's turn our attention to some of the liver associate enzymes in various liver diseases, particularly as it relates to hepatitic and alcohol-related liver diseases. In the hepatocyte, which I show you here as the blue square, and I showed the mitochondria, remember that the mitochondria are relatively rich in AST, and the cytoplasm is relatively enriched in ALT. I've shown you before that the way one has elevation or even has, has any serum uh, liver-associated enzymes is that the hepatocyte actually blebs off little bits of its cytoplasm. And it represents the concentration of AST and ALT, where ALT is higher than AST. And that's why in most liver uh, hepatitic patterns of injury, ALT is greater than AST. In the setting of mitochondrial primary liver injuries, particularly which can happen in the setting of alcohol particularly, but is not solely responsible to the alcohol, one can have it in the setting of say Wilson's disease, but mitochondrial primary liver injury leads to injury of the mitochondria, leading to AST going out of the mitochondria and now the ratio of AST and ALT and the cytoplasm of that injured hepatocyte has changed. And when that blebs off now, one can have AST greater than ALT. This is the model that I put together to help explain in the setting of alcohol, how one may have an AST to ALT ratio that is flipped, i.e. two to one. I would not use that to say, oh, that's alcohol disease. I merely show you this model to point out some of the mechanism of how one may explain that through primary mitochondrial injury. Now, again, leading to the question, how does steatosis lead to steatohepatitis? And the answer is we don't know completely. I've shown you a couple of things that I think may be important in terms of acetylation and the role of free fatty acids. But keep in mind that steatosis alone is not sufficient. And so, for example, in a genetic syndrome, A beta protein, A beta lipoproteinemia, one may have a lot of steatosis in, in the hepatocyte, but it does not lead to steatohepatitis and it does not lead to fibrosis. Another example is that there's a genetic syndrome where there is a defect in the assembly of peroxisomes. And while that does not lead to steatosis, it does lead to um, biliary or biliary pattern of injury of fibrosis and liver injury in this case, because the peroxisomes are important in terms of cholesterol metabolism and metabolizing things to bile acid. So even though it is a defect actually in the metabolism of very long chain fatty acid, it does not itself lead to quote unquote fatty liver disease. It may also be important as in terms of the type of fats that one has in their liver, which is reflective of what one eats, be they polyunsaturated, be they omega-3s, et cetera. I following the Mediterranean diet, even if you have um, are obese, um, if you follow the Mediterranean diet, which is rich in omega-3s, when uh, has a, a very low likelihood, low likelihood of developing fatty liver disease. So it may also be important as terms of the types of fats that are stored. Turning to the peroxisomes, again, they are important in terms of oxidizing very long chain fatty acids and are important in terms of taking cholesterol esters and synthesizing them into bile acids. 
I want to show you another case of a young female who is 35 weeks pregnant who presents with liver failure. And on biopsy, she was shown in this, we did this at the time of frozen section. This is an H&E of her biopsy. And what one sees is that there is a lot of almost microvesicular steatosis. And we proved that those vacuoles were lipid, lipid by or red O stain. But you can also see within the hepatocytes, there's a lot of cholestasis, but there's no inflammation. So this is an example of pure microvesicular steatosis, pure microvesicular steatosis with associated cholestasis. On electron microscopy, we did in point of fact show again that there is microvesicular steatosis. So the diagnosis in this case is acute fatty liver of pregnancy. You can see that there is, there is a microvesicular steatosis and the hepatocytes are a bit enlarged, but I wouldn't call them, quote, ballooning degeneration. So how does that work in terms of acute fatty liver pregnancy? And how can we roll that into our understanding of normal lipid metabolism? Well, part of what is thought to happen in this rare disorder is that there are genetic defects in some of the metabolism involved in beta oxidation of fatty acids within the mitochondria. This happens in both the mom and the baby. And because of those defects, there can be generated a toxic fatty acid because of the incomplete ability for this beta oxidation through um, the uh, mutations of this, particularly in the baby. And that toxic fatty acid can go to the mom's liver, causing the defect that we just showed you. So again, this represents a defect in beta oxidation, particularly at the level of the mitochondria. I want to close with one last case. And this is a uh, gentleman with a history of heart disease and atrial fibrillation. And it was being evaluated for ascites. A liver biopsy was performed and I show you what it is here. What one can see is there's a portal tract, but you can see that, I'll go back one moment, sorry, go back a moment here, that there is abundant Mallory Highland, that there is again minimal steatosis, and this is, again, brings up the thing, what do we do when you have a lot of balloony degeneration, tons of Mallory's hyaline, but really minimal to none, no steatosis? So in this particular case, especially when you see a lot of Mallory hyaline with little in the way of steatosis, I and think of really a few things. And the thing that I would think of here is that this is the case, and point of fact, this patient had been taking for a while amiodarone. Amiodarone may cause a abundant Mallory hyaline without a true steatohepatitic pattern of injury, but it may be present and minimal. But it's a great example to show you how you can have a disconnect of the degree of Mallory hyaline with the amount of, quote, steatohepatitis or steatosis. The process by which this occurs is that this molecule can inhibit the phospholipase and it prevents phospholipid degradation. That alone may not cause the, these events, but additionally, this amiodarone and its equivalent types of molecules may enter the mitochondria and uncouple oxidative uh, phosphorylation and inhibit and disrupt fatty acid beta oxidation. So another theme of disrupting, uncoupling beta oxidation in the mitochondria as one of the key figures that may be important in terms of this type of steatohepatitic type of liver injury. Amiodarone is not the only compound of a similar molecular phenotype. There are a host of compounds that can do very similar things. I must point out, however, on this list, the second one, tamoxifen, in my experience, uh, is a little bit different in that it really does cause a true 
outright stay out of hepatitic pattern of injury. But just keep that in mind that one may have that disconnect. So what I've tried to do today is to show you that the liver uh, plays a central role in terms of lipid metabolism, that there is a dynamic state, and that there are various ways where one can disrupt that dynamic state leading to the accumulation of lipid within the liver, leading to disruption of oxidation, beta oxidation, be it mitochondria, be it through peroxisomes, that can cause disruption of fatty acid oxidation, generation of free fatty acids, which may be toxic, free radical oxidation through mitochondria, but then the peroxisomes in terms of very long chain fatty acid oxidation and their role in terms of bile acid metabolism. So with that, I will close. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me through Twitter, follow me on Twitter. And thank you very much for your attention. You now have enough knowledge to deal with steatohepatitic and other patterns of liver injury. And this closes this session. <laughs>